Hi, my name is Kim Metcherson, co-dean of Rutgers Law School in Camden, and this is The Power of Attorney. I'm really excited today to be here with yet another one of our wonderful alums, Rebecca Borden. Um, and hopefully we will have a very free-ranging conversation about all the amazing things that you have done with your life, even before you came to Rutgers Law School, but certainly after um, Rutgers Law School. So thank you so much for being here with us, Rebecca. Thank you, Kim. I'm really glad to be here. Excellent. So what I really like to do is get a sense from people of how they ended up here, right? Of all, of all yes. the different careers that you could have chosen, why law school? And then why Rutgers Law School? Yeah, so I have thought about it. My dad was a business person who always wished he was a lawyer. He came back from lawyer meetings and would say things like, promissory estoppel, they have a secret <laughs> code. Uh, I, it's a such a cool name. And I felt bad at math, mm. and I felt good with words. Okay. And I also was oldest daughter of three fiercely independent, wanted to support myself, wanted a profession, Got it. and was a New Jersey, Phil Philadelphia born, mm -hmm. bred, raised in New Jersey, and a little bit afraid to branch out beyond my home turf, mm -hmm. and convinced that Rutgers as a state school was a very competitive school. Okay. You know, concerned also for finances. Right. And glad to be at a state school. Right, right, yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely, definitely the case that we're still a place that appeals to people in part because you can come out with a lot less debt yes. <laughs> than at other schools. Yes. Although I will say, having traveled around and talked to some of our, our older alums and hearing them tell me what the tuition was when they were in school, I always say to them, please don't tell any of our current students yeah. how much you paid to I go can't to law remember. school here. Yeah. I can't remember. It seemed like a lot, but I don't know. Yeah, it's all relative yeah. ultimately. Mm -hmm. So what did you what did you think law school was going to be like? And then did it sort of live up or, or live down to your expectations? Well, I hoped I would succeed. And I think I suffered a little bit of lack of confidence. Mm. And I came feeling like I was about to climb a mountain. Okay. And I think I got the gist of it after like year two that you just have to persist and use your mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. Just the, the slog. Yeah. I, I think it was more of a, uh, like, can I apply myself to these things that are being offered to me to learn? Right. Yeah, and can I put in the effort that's needed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were there particular classes or particular professors that really stood yes. out for you? Yeah, and I wanted to remember to thank, like the experience of coming and connecting to professors is what made it a personal experience for me. So uh, Anne Friedman, mm -hmm. who has written one of the seminal books in sex discrimination with a group of other prominent women, including, I think, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. Her classes, her support, I think we launched the award. Oh, Mary Philbrook. Yes, right, I think I was Philbrook with her award. when she asked student help to launch that yeah. award. Bob Williams, State mm -hmm. Con Law. And Bob recently also gave advice to my sister who was thinking as an adult to, to come to law school. Right. Roger Clark, I remember at the time I was graduating and considering a Rotary Scholarship to go to Australia or New Zealand. He's, he, he was the voice of reason when lots of people were saying, why would you leave right after starting mm -hmm. work? Why would you go outside of the United States? Right. He was like, go, go, go. Yeah. What a wonderful experience. And Absolutely. had a lot of know-how about the reason, mm -hmm. the region. Uh, Jay Feynman. Mm -hmm. um, and at the, at the time I was in law school, he taught contorts with Mark oh, Feldman. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, can, you, can you tell people what contorts was? What I remember. Uh -huh. So it may not be fair to what it was. It was a, a crash course in torts and contracts together to say there's a lot of black letter law and then there's a lot of overlap and so one of the right. jobs of being a lawyer is to spot issues you need to be fluid in your thinking about what is an area of law contracts versus torts look at how many times they overlap yeah. and so it was unnerving a class I remember and exciting and we, we were unnerved because it was not what the rest of the contracts and torts classes right. were having yeah yeah. It's sort of a famous experiment here. Concept. Yes. We still talk about there's it. There's an article. There's a law <laughs> review article. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I came out feeling supported yeah. and ready to go. And I, on graduation, 
got a full-time job where I had been a student working at the Women's Law Project in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And amazing, it's what I wanted to do. Thought I was in law school to change the world, sure. be a proactive lawyer, social engineer, can we make a difference? And I remember sh shortly into it realizing I can't pay my student loans right. <laughs> on a nonprofit salary. <laughs> I was working on Saturdays at a fa family law firm mm -hmm. in Cherry Hill, and that one of the principals of that firm said, hey, I'm in the Rotary. I'm, I'm supposed to drum up applicants for this scholarship that Rotary gives for a one-year postgraduate study overseas. Mm -hmm. And so I took the packet. He said, could you post it at school or you know, let people know about it? And when I read it, I applied. Right. Yeah. And it was to go to a place that you could speak the language, that you had researched enough to know it was furthering a, a, an LLM that's furthering your career plans. Okay. And I interviewed with Rotary Group mm -hmm. in South Jersey, and I remember this experience of sitting with a room full of men, a very long table, and one of them saying, what's all this women's studies stuff on your <laughs> resume? And me <laughs> thinking, well, I'll just say it as blandly as possible, I need role models, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I learned a lot about what's possible uh, for women to achieve. And another Rotary person asked, what do you think of this Supreme Court case challenging our Rotary rule that only men can be full members? Wow. And I drew a breath and I thought, oh, now I have to reveal my true <laughs> thoughts about right. equality and opportunities for women. And as I thought I was going to reveal myself to what felt like a room full of conservative men, they started arguing. <gasps> and one said, let them get their own damn clubs. And another said, my wife is a, a, a a joining member or you know whatever right. the name for it and they started arguing and then the person at the end of the table said N it's not the time or the place and we moved on <laughs> wow <laughs> so i didn't get the scholarship but i right before the beginning of the year i learned that the person who got it had chosen not to go mm -hmm. to japan and i was second and so i could go to start the school year I think at the end of February okay. in my first choice, which was Australia. I love that. Yeah. I love stories like that, right? Yeah. I love the story where, like, you, you, you know, you don't get it, and you're kind of like, well, you know, at least I oh, tried. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It was a good dream. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So why why did you pick Australia? I could speak the language. It mm -hmm. seemed far. I yeah, probably, definitely. you know, it was a very valuable plane ticket that yeah. was included in the scholarship. Right. So it's a really, it was a, a really generous postgraduate scholarship. Okay. You know, competitive with like a Fulbright. So yeah. the full tuition paid, housing paid for one year. During that year, I studied and I also got a part time job with the Law Society of Victoria, the mm -hmm. state where I was in Melbourne, Australia. And met a lot of practicing attorneys and eventually met a firm that was an IP mm -hmm. firm that was looking for, had a lot of American clients. And mm -hmm. so when I started talking about the differences in litigation, I by that time had learned how, how different our systems are and what, yeah. are, what is similar. You know, no depositions, only document discovery. And Pretty soon I was working at that firm and it was amazing and I got some help to get uh, permanent residence. So I ended up living and working there for 14 years. Right. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I definitely want to get back to talking about IP, intellectual yeah. property for, for folks who, who aren't, aren't in the know. But I also just want to talk a little bit about travel. So were you someone who had done a lot of traveling before law school or was the Rotary um, Scholarship a, a chance to really sort of... Well, you know, branch out. I don't think I was a big traveler. I was a big dreamer of travel. Right. And I had felt my own fears. Like I realized mm -hmm. I had s gone to Rutgers undergrad. During law school, I went up back up to New Brunswick to do an MA in politics at what was the Eagleton Institute mm -hmm. of Politics. Um, so I was very New Jersey based. And this felt like a safe way to really explore. Right. And I really did think I was going for nine months. Right. So once I realized what part of the world I was in uh -huh. and things that I could see and just that independence of establishing a life, a f circle of friends, work with nothing around me that was familiar, it was really an incredible confidence builder. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, something that reinforced, like I think those professors that I named were, were teachers who always reinforced possibilities for the students. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was grounded in like the Rotary Clubs at that point, and I knew this wasn't a crazy thing, and right. I had uh, gotten settled in a way that I really enjoyed. So it was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think one of the things that I love about um, being at Rutgers is that we do often get students who are, you know, Jersey-based, Jersey-focused, that's kind of been, been their life. And we have these these travel opportunities. I teach South African con law. We go to, you know, mm -hmm. we take the students to South Africa. We've got a Cuba trip. We've got a Guatemala trip. And I just find it amazing how just even having that one short travel experience yes. is just hugely expansive yes. for people's minds and their and you know the way that they they yes. view the world. After practicing intellectual property law with a private firm, I was recruited into a large entertainment company that owned Blockbuster Video mm -hmm. Global Chain at that time, very successful. Right. And I'm, I'm I'm hurting thinking about the like 20 year olds who are like blockbuster what? video. What? You kidding? It was a big career move <laughs> yeah. at the time. Um, but the amazing thing was that as a person based in Melbourne, Australia, I was responsible for the legal matters for the company in its owned and franchised businesses in Asia and Australia, and New Zealand. Okay. And so incredible opportunities: Japan, yeah. Hong Kong, Taiwan, I Philippines. Love that. You know, at that point, I was young and learning and ready to do anything. And right. so, honestly, I was jumping off of planes and showering and going back to work. And yeah. It was a very exciting, it's just completely exciting. Yeah. Almost the whole time. <laughs> yeah. That's such a that's yeah. such a great experience to have been able to have. Mm -hmm. Really tremendous. Yeah. So, you ended up staying in Australia. I did. For, for 14, 14 years. years. Yes. And, you know, building a life there, you know, building a career there, really. I mean, 14 years is a yes. long time. But now you're here. Now you're right. in New York. So a couple things happened in my family. One of my sisters had her second child mm -hmm. in Wilmington, Delaware. And I started thinking, I'm, I'm really far yeah. from these nieces who are growing. I don't have children of my own. Mm -hmm. And I started just imagining what it would be like to come back. And... I had a house, I had a relationship, but it was, it really felt like time. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, after a lot of job hunting, there was a job in intellectual property in New York okay. with the parent company of mm -hmm. what was then Block Blockbuster Video. Right. So I moved to New York with my Australian accent. There's still people <laughs> I work with that laugh and say, I thought you were Australian born and bred when you <laughs> arrived. And, uh, uh, you know, just a really different sensibility about legal practice. I, I did not appreciate how conflict-oriented, <laughs> you know, the U.S., the, even just thinking about trademarks. I remember one of the ways that you prepare for product launches or service launches and the new name is to get a trademark search to ensure that nobody else already has something that's confusingly similar. And in Australia, I remember you know, that's where I did those trademark searches. And I came to the United States. I was like, this is a very crowded register that makes it harder mm. to figure out what's confusingly similar. Right. Um, you know, so it was a big adjustment. I felt like a foreigner coming to the United States at right. that point. Right. Yes. And then 9-11 happened during right. that year. I was so optimistic and learning so much. And it was such a strange, terrible negative in the course yeah. of a really incredible professional growth period and right. uh, just the joy of being back in the United States. Right, right. Yeah. Let's talk about intellectual property a sure. little bit. So I feel like there are all of these areas of law, you know, you talk to a student who comes to admitted student day, they say, oh yeah, I want to do, you know, intellectual property. But if you actually push them on it, they would have very little idea of what it looks like to be somebody who's doing IP yes. work. So if you were, if you were to describe to uh, an aspiring law student, what it, it, what, what it is that you do yes. as somebody who's doing intellectual property. How would you describe well, it? Well, just two foundation ideas. One mm -hmm. is that trademarks are brands and other identifiers of products and services, so that this is really about consumer protection, consumer confusion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the thing that lets you know you're getting what you think you're getting associated with brands. Um, and copyright as a protector of creative works. So, 
you know, this is a this is a shorthand way to say it, but just that I've, I've been working for a long time for an entertainment industry. I know there's other ways to look at it, but protecting creativity is one of the reasons that people get paid to make creative works or right. work at entertainment industries. So one of the issues that people talk about is piracy and how, oh, who's hurt? And it's a big entertainment company anyway, and the movie stars make a, a you know, load of, but there's millions of people in the United States. It's a huge industry where there are people working all kinds of skilled jobs that as long as the company's making money, they're paying and they're expanding and making more content. So those two ideas are the underpinnings of what me and a big team of, well, I should say, small team of lawyers. <laughs> we do a lot, but it's a small team of lawyers. We work to protect the brand online and physically so that when people are getting, for example, visiting a social media site and thinking they're looking at a profile of somebody either that's talent or releasing programming that it's really us. Right. A really wide range of online work to protect our works and our brands. And the other thing is like a company that right now entertainment companies are so concentrated so they own tons of brands. Mm -hmm. and, and um, People are interacting with a lot of brands and not realizing like it's one entity that's distributing lots of types of content under different brands. Okay. So you gave the Listoka lecture a number of years ago and, and you were talking about, you know, copyright and, and, and piracy and in particular talking about YouTube and people uploading yes. all of this content onto YouTube and the various ways in which people get around. Yes. And, you know, uh, avoid being detected. <laughs> right? That's right. So yeah. YouTube and other social media platforms have been an amazing opportunity for promotion, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, there's a lot of eyeballs there. Our companies do a lot of promotion on those websites. And in addition, it's been attractive to fans or people who are seeking to get ad revenue or almost like organized crime to just keep uploading popular entertainment content for the purpose of getting viewers or getting mm -hmm. ad revenue. And YouTube built a tool mm -hmm. that enables content owners to ingest their content. A digital fingerprint is made, which is an abbreviated um. form of the file, a simplified form of the of the file. From a fingerprint, you can't make this show. You are um, looking at zeros and ones that help detection of matches um, of of files that match the um, uploads of files that match the original content. Got it. And the and so are you all just constantly contacting YouTube and say, take it down, take it so down, So it's really it interesting. Down. A lot of it is automated. Oh, and okay. then we, one of the things about working in this area is automation doesn't solve everything. Right. So in a hopeful day, I say, like, technology got us into this, technology get us out. It's great this tool is there. And in addition, we need humans who are looking at YouTube and looking for our shows. The thing about the detection is that it, it is a, it's got its limitations. Mm -hmm. And so immediately people started uploading videos and making them left to right so that you'd be looking at it backwards. Oh. Or um, <laughs> now the version is to have the video uh, smaller and the, the sides of the frame have fireworks going right. off for other things because the <laughs> fingerprints detect how the elements move or how the sound is heard. Right. And so if you have a lot of confusion on the screen, um, right. it it is potentially defeating the matching process. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And people just sit around and they put so much work into being able it's to interesting, avoid like detection. It's interesting. Like the the range of reasons people do that the uploading is some from really altruistic I'm a big fan of the show mm -hmm. and I want to make it look great and I want to highlight Judge Judy I want to highlight <laughs> you know like um, last night's episode of my favorite show and then there's really just people organized to take advantage of the fact that there's ad revenue to be gained mm -hmm. if um, videos are popular and this is really valuable stuff right yeah right 
So I want to, uh, you said, you know, technology got, got us uh-huh. into this. Technology can get us out of it, at least for a particular, in some particular uh-huh. ways. But you've been, you know, you've been practicing in this area for, for quite some time. I have. And I'm really curious to hear you talk about how industry has changed, how being a lawyer working within this industry has changed over the, the, the stretch of time that you've been involved. Yeah, so understanding the technology is a key and being able to explain the technology to our business folks. And I'm not a technologist, so we, we hire technology. People are skilled in technological train. They've had the training and they can analyze the numbers. They can understand how these tools are working, how we can enhance them. It's been funny because there's like a shared language with lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so I do work with a lot of talented lawyers who we've recruited in this intellectual property area, trademarks, copyrights. And also now we have on the team technology specialists who have come with um, some background usually of working in a copyright area. Okay. Maybe from music companies, maybe from some of the vendors that work in this field. And they come with a different language and a different outlook. And I often feel like I'm just being corrected all the time. Like sometimes <laughs> I'll say a term and I, I know what I mean and I think people around me know what I mean and you know I'll be corrected. And um, it, it's, it's a funny experience because it's like a precision that in some respects I think, oh, it, it, you get it, you right, get it. Right. But if it were a law term, I'd be, be being right. really precise <laughs> about it. So I appreciate, you know, it's just another area of expertise right. that I have to become proficient in right. communicating. Right. Yeah, I yeah. think one of the, that's one of the things that I think can be really interesting about, you know, being a practicing attorney, that if you get into a particular area that you have to learn a bunch of stuff that you it hadn't occurred yes. to you that you would have to know and understand because you can't do the work yes. unless you understand that 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 technological piece of it to yes. some degree. And when you think like we're on one sharp edge of it, but contracts, lawyers, data mm-hmm. management, there's so many just even in law practice or in our own in-house legal practice, the things that we need to do have to develop all the time for efficiency and for compliance and yeah I'd prefer it didn't right. <laughs> you know right but at the same time we're working with a lot of young people who come with those expectations right. like I'm I'm older and I've had to adapt I um, went to law school without computers mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think right around the year I graduated the Sony Betamax case was decided by the Supreme Court and that was a case that said oh Home copying's okay, and one of the things the court said was, you know, these videotapes, these Betamax videotapes, they're not forever. Like, people are copying over them. They're just time <laughs> shifting. They're not going to have a closet full of, of tapes of all the shows. This is not library building. You right. know, it's such a funny thing to think now that that was the outlook about what people would be doing with professional content. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And it is, mm-hmm. I mean, it's really extraordinary. I mean, I, I still have VHS tapes. Right? I have no, <laughs> nothing I could use nothing to, to actually play, play them. them. On, right? um, but I still have them. Mm. But it is really extraordinary to see how the technology has shifted, yeah. right? Even since we were, you know, young to teenagers to in their 20s, uh, you know, the internet and the ability to sort of, you know, digitally grab things yeah. and and then to be able to disperse them yep. um, you know so widely so i feel like one of the things that's probably challenging when you are on one hand charged with protecting copyright but also don't want to alienate people who are customers and who yes. are consumers so how do you all you know, I, I, you know, I, I have two young kids and, and they have gotten me into YouTube. So I watch all sorts of things on YouTube and it always makes me laugh when somebody has, you know, you know, the very first thing in the description is, you know, no violation of copyright intended. Like, okay, <laughs> that's not how right, any of this no works. Right, there's no intent in this, uh, in this law. Right. So um, how do you, how do you figure out how to, how to balance that? Yeah. So, um, it's not easy. Like it's a big education issue that I'm not sure that, that we as the industry are doing as best we can. Mm -hmm. I also have seen over time people develop as consumers. So they 
are, I know um, young people are learning quickly how to get access to unauthorized, mm -hmm. but I also have seen a lot of people come into the industry and go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I do want to get paid. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah, right. I do wish there was a paying job at this right. place. And I think also just the, the, the industry has developed so quickly on delivering what you want, when you want it, right. how you want it. And I think this idea of like, well, the only thing it is is, is it's either paid or ad supported. Mm -hmm. And this idea like, well, if it were free, um, that, you know, and I, you're competing with free, but what I know is that there have been situations where my employer has put content out for free, yes, mm -hmm. ad supported, but valuable live content. And there still was access to pirated, wow. you know, it's even free mm -hmm. because of the iner inherent value, because people want to see it, you know, and diverting or siphoning off and being a deliverer of that content is. Um, a way to make money. Right. It's a way to get some prestige if you're, you know, inclined to try to be the provider. Right. Um, and so it seems like this idea that, well, if you only gave it to me the way I wanted it, it, it doesn't really feel like a genuine critique unless you're just committed to trying to take things for free. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I mean, that, that seems that seems to me to be an issue across a lot of different domains of entertainment, right? So people who say, you know, I don't want to pay for a newspaper, you know, I don't mm. want to pay for that that content. I yeah. should be able to get it for free, you know, and the New York Times and the Washington Post yes. are like, how are we supposed right. to pay reporters if we give everything away for free? So it does seem like we're in this this time period where we're trying to figure that We figure are, that out. yeah, and we've lived through a very big change particularly in the music industry, just as such a constriction mm -hmm. because of unauthorized consumption. Right. And I've had friends, I have a friend who's a graphic designer who used to design book covers. Mm. And uh, first she started with album covers. Okay. You know, so right. we've been around a long time. Yeah. It was hard, you know, album covers. And then when the music industry changed, she went to book covers. Now e ebooks right. is changing that industry. And I've had a friend who worked at magazines mm -hmm. who has had three different layoffs in her career. So it's rough, you yeah. know, that's, that's a, a lot to adapt to, right. I think, for all of us. Right. So I wanna talk, I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk more about sort of your experience as a woman in law. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely industries where I think people would say that tends to be very male dominated. And I'm not sure whether people would think about this this sort of the IP entertainment space as being male dominated. So I'll tell you a okay. gross generality. People talk about soft IP and hard IP. Interesting. Excuse me, male, yeah. female. Yeah. That's how it lines <laughs> up. Patents that are science based or mechanically based and are more lucrative for law firms are called hard IP. <gasps> Wow. Soft IP, trademarks and copyrights, which are harder for law firms to make money on unless it's litigation and disputes. Right. You know, just the administration, the clearing, the filing, the, the maintaining these assets, getting and maintaining these assets is not that lucrative for law firms. Okay. It's a lot of repetitive work, but you need a lot of skill right. um, and training. So I feel like one of the challenges of our time is how to make equality and opportunities and compensation, retention decisions for women, for racially diverse LGBTQ. You know, these, these categories of people who had not had the opportunity and um, have entered in growing numbers need we need attention to that. We need the law practice to reflect our communities. Right. And I think, you know, my journey was I was a little baby budding feminist reading this magazine before right. I went to college. <laughs> so I wanted to work at the Women's Law Project. That's all I wanted to do. And I think, you know, I, I lived with just internalizing some things that I think maybe were worth me having some lack of confidence about, but but also feeling like how do I fit in and where's my place when you're looking at, at, at the time and still generally speaking about who are the bosses, yeah. you know, majority men, right. white men. Right, um, right. 
Yeah, I remember also my friend in Australia at a big firm saying to me, oh, we just got our grooming and preparing for client services. And she, at her firm, she needed a doctor's note to wear flat shoes. <gasps> and I, I, this is the 80s in, in wow. Australia. You know, so you, you still sometimes see, you know, like grooming classes and clothing <laughs> classes and, you know, the attention on female appearance Absolutely. just because it can vary so much compared to the uniform of... Um, what men typically Absolutely. look like in law firms. Yeah, so oh. I think it, the, the, what I thought was, gosh, give me a law degree and I'll compete and this idea that there's disparity will somehow disappear. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's not. Right. And that we need to turn positive attention to say, how do we include because otherwise the assumptions and the sort of vision of hirers and educators, we just, if we're not working to include, we necessarily exclude. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I think has been very powerful in these conversations that we've been having, you know, everything from the sexual harassment stuff to, to pay equity. And one of the things that's become very clear is that the fact that we are all so quiet about money and the fact that a lot of women are are deeply socialized not to be aggressive about money means that women are often getting underpaid has that been an experience for you has that been something you've had to let work me through? share about something that was life-changing when i befriended a lawyer who worked for a different company this is early in my career who after our friendship developed she shared with me, I, was, I said, I think I might be being underpaid, and she shared with me her salary, mm -hmm. which I did not expect. And once she did, I had to get over the depression right. and the feeling like, oh, how will I ever, this isn't fair, right. to a method of making sure I was explaining my value mm -hmm. and in a calm and clear way saying there's comparative salaries to look at and also this is what I've accomplished. And um, with that information, significant change for right. me. Yeah, and it is it is not ingrained. It's hard for me. I don't, I, you know, it, it was a very trusted friendship mm -hmm. uh, that made it possible, I think, for her to share and me to treat that appropriately. And I also needed from her just some help on, like, how do I change this thing? Right, right. Yeah, so I do remember a weekend with her and her wife mm -hmm. and, uh, at the beach, kind of, they were coaching me. Right, You know, right, like, what right. are you going to say about this? What are you going to say about <laughs> this? It's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> no, that's right. not good. <laughs> you can't start yeah. that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So a pivotal moment. Um, and also, I think, at that time with that boss, really a trust-building exercise mm -hmm. because I think it was a real gap. And in uh, me expressing it the way I did, and then working to improve it in the way that this boss wanted to. We, we came to a mutual kind of respect and understanding about how this needed to be handled. And yeah, I learned so much from that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think that also speaks to the importance of having friendships and mentors. Yes. You know, so having somebody who says to you, I'm going to give you this information about salary because I think it's important for you to know and to understand yes. Yes. Um, how easy it is to be to be underpaid. Yeah. You know, especially when so much of this is, is opaque. People are discouraged from talking about yes. their salaries yes. in the workplace. And you know, that's changing. Like I see some of Silicon Valley being mm -hmm. um, overt about it. Thank goodness. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a different atmosphere. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think another piece of it, and I'm, I'm just thinking about, I can't remember who the actress was, but he was talking about pay equity, and she said, you know, when you're talking about $10 million, $15 million, you know, it seems so ludicrous to mm. demand, I want to be paid, you mm. know, five more, you know, million dollars, but it's the principle, right? Well, like, why should I take less money? Right? It's yeah. role modeling for all of us. That Absolutely. In, a, in an atmosphere where you're looking cautiously for your next job mm -hmm. um, to even then, you know, raise it. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've actually had conversations about pay equity with my daughter and mm -hmm. my son. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully in the next generations, we will have people who, you know, walk into the workplace, one, with the expectation that they will be paid yes. equitably, but two, 
where their bosses are taking the position that this is something that's really critical for us as, a, as an institution. Yeah. So, fi- you know, fingers crossed, that's where we're headed. Yeah. We haven't been specific about where you work <laughs> or what your role is. Yeah. And I'm fine with, I, you, you make the call um, on whether you're, you're comfortable talking about where you work, but certainly it'd be helpful to, to talk about the fact that you're, so, you're, you're the big boss. So it's changing, right? So I work, worked at CBS Corporation for the last 14 years, prior to that Viacom. The companies merged, but I ha- had been the head, co-head and head of IP yep. at um, CBS. Okay. And that required a whole nother set of learning management skills, mm-hmm. and none of that came naturally. Mm. Uh, you know, it really, it took me a while to just understand how the smallest thing for me can change somebody's motivation sure. or attention. and. I just really love working as a team, especially in-house, especially where, you know, our skills are to listen to a business idea and no matter how, you know, risky it sounds, you say yes. And if you're going to do that, how about this, this, and this to help reduce the risks that I'm going to tell you about? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and that is a lot of development of skills that we talk to each other in, in our legal practice and our intellectual property legal practice in-house to help the business get done what it wants to get done. Mm-hmm. It's a fun environment. It's terrific. And, and to be with business people who are smart and adapting in this incredibly p- fast pace of changing technology, changing business, right. um, and to be able to be working with them, it's really an exciting environment. That's great. Yeah. Because you are in the position that you are in, which allows you, you know, you can hire people, you can you can set the tone for the people who work in in your department. You can you can decide, you know, what the policies and practices are to a certain extent within the group of people who you're working with. So I'm curious about given what you you were saying about, you know, you have to be really intentional and we have to really be sort of paying attention to these issues. Are there particular things that you feel like you've been able to do? In, in, in your particular role to, to open up this, this avenue of career yeah, to more people? Yeah, a couple people? things. One is I right now am co-heading the Law Department Diversity Committee, mm-hmm. and that is a combined effort of right now, I think about 50 people in our law department who are working on different aspects of mentoring and communicating. We have a lot of uh, a continuing legal education program when we're concentrating on how can we learn more about the changes that we need to be making happen. Mm-hmm. I also feel like as a person who's gone through this weird path of going overseas and coming back, it helps me be open to people that have had a little bit of an unusual path. Mm-hmm. And so right now we have like one Rutgers Newark grad who came to us as a law student working as a clerk in some of the copyright enforcement work that we do, kind of repetitive tasks. But as he went to law school, graduated, clerk for a judge, got a job, and then came back, you know, because in-house, you often need training outside before you can get in there. Yeah, so I do feel attuned to looking for people whose paths are a little bit unusual. That's great. Mm-hmm. And those people, I think, can also just be incredibly interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and perspective. Done a have a different perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Another thing that I think is challenging, you know, the joke that I often make about um, being a professor and being in education is that, you know, we keep getting older, but the students stay the same <laughs> age. And I wonder about sort of how that plays itself out in your context right so you know i think mostly technology is the is the challenge yeah you know just that really because we work so much with that it reminds me i think our mentor our cle group is looking for some speakers about intergenerational work environments right because we are you know i do remember coming to the law department and there was someone who didn't know how to do reply all, you know, <laughs> on emails. You know, and it's constantly like, yes, copying back in all the people who were on this email at the beginning. You know, and I don't want to be one of those people. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, I think that there's, there's something really useful 
particularly in the sort of entertainment industry, in having people in the space who are younger and who are from a different generation yeah. and who are sort of thinking about thinking about the world in really different ways because they've grown up yeah. in a really different time period. Yeah, and for sure in the content creation world, yeah. diversity makes a huge difference of age and experience and background. The lawyers in an entertainment company, generally speaking, are not welcome to make, you know, creative contribution. Right. <laughs> because one of the things we do is we clear titles of new shows, uh -huh. and sometimes it's sometimes it's very simple. The title comes, and that that's what we clear, and that's what they want. They do audience testing and other approvals that need to be done. But when we say, oh, we've been through like 16 t possible titles, how about this? Because right. we've seen the theme they're in. <laughs> Nobody's interested. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear from the lawyers what we think about the creative. Right, right, yeah. right. Although, you know, we probably have some good ideas sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure that that's true. That's not what the, we're there for. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, but, but it is a partnership in that there, there have been times when we're looking at, I think the creative part is looking at what's a high-risk piece of content or title choice and finding a way to make it less risky. Right. Like that's the fun of the job. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you have you ended up in litigation very much or have you been able to So we have a great litigation team. Yeah. And we're really fortunate that not a lot that we've worked on has resulted in litigation or litigation that's had merit. Right. So we are constantly though dealing with disputes. Mm -hmm. So people either saying you created that based on my idea right. or um, your launch has created confusion with my product or service right. um, and that's what we're trained to handle. You yeah. know, to, we've done a lot of pre-work to make sure that's not true mm -hmm. and we and other you know, lawyers who are in the production field, there's a lot of work that gets done to make sure that those allegations are not true right. and then responding to those claims usually falls with us. Right. Yeah. And do you, do you all do the cease and desist? Tons. <laughs> thousands. <laughs> thousands of cease and desist. Yes. Yes. And um, cease and desist that are very firm and have a close deadline and cease and desist that are super polite and invite people to call us mm -hmm. and cease and desist that say, but if you do this, that'll end the dispute that we have. Um, phone calls instead of letters. Wow. You know, we're constantly trying to clear the path for our own product right. and also stop confusion or copying in the marketplace. Right. Yeah. How do you decide which category of oh, cease and desist you're going to use? Not a science, but you know, sometimes you'll see a very um, unwitting infringement of our rights. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, categories like churches or right, right, you know, right. a phone call seems appropriate <laughs> to say, we probably didn't mean this, but right. this is what's happening. Right. Yeah. Right. Whereas if it's like a business venture. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah. then you also know that you're probably going to be up against their lawyers too. Yes. Yeah. Often people are <laughs> represented. Um, and yeah, there's individuals who we'd rather just talk it through. Sometimes just talking it through makes it easier for them to understand, less expensive to resolve. Right. You know, there's been one persistent infringer that was young. And you know, when it's like a youthful person who feels very assertive about their mm -hmm. rights and might be wrong, <laughs> like at one point after quite a bit of argument, I was like, I think I'm going to call your dad. <laughs> you know, it sort of changed the tone of the conversation. That's Let's so call funny. your dad. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the point where the other person gets really embarrassed, right? Once you have I don't to bring know. Your parents. It sort of went on after that, but yeah, it did change the tone a little bit. Right, right, right. So one of the things that I think is really wonderful, Rebecca, is that your sister became a law student here at Rutgers Law. So can we talk about her a little bit? She was a paralegal, uh -huh. and changes were happening in her life. And she was working at a firm in South Jersey, Grace and Heberly, who does estates and other advice to individuals. And I am embarrassed that we, we were talking with him about my sister, with her, and he said, you know, you could be in three or four years working here as a paralegal or as a lawyer. And I'm embarrassed that he said that right. and I wasn't saying to my sister, how right. about law school <laughs> in the midst of these big changes? But, you know, just that sentence that he said opened 
her eyes, yeah. and how about, you know, my eyes, and really set her on a path. She just completed all of her classes and exams and yeah. is studying for the bar. So, you know, as an adult, the possibility of coming to law school, honestly, I really was thinking, you know, that's a, I just remember it as a big challenge in my past. Right. But she embraced it and yeah. I felt and like the law a young, school. Embraced. Young child. Yes, yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah. So when that possibility and she started thinking about it, she was like, like well, what, what do you think I would do? Well, I, I was able to send her back to some of the law professors right. who are still here that, from my time, which is amazing yeah. to think about. And they were so supportive and encouraging and, um, you know, it's changing her life. I think it's something yeah. that I sometimes get weirdly sentimental and emotional about, but honestly, mm -hmm. you know, my dad and his brother were the only people who went to college and families on both sides. And to have a career, like this amazing, exciting, fortunate career, Rutgers made that possible for me. Yeah. And I see it making it possible for my sister. And yeah. it, it just really touches me that, you know, the state school, New Jersey, not glamorous, not sexy, right. but boy, it really changed my life. Yeah. That's, that's, that's so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things when, you know, when people ask me, what is it that I love about where I work? Yeah. What you just said mm -hmm. is exactly what it is that you can, you can watch somebody come in here. We have so many first generation students, you know, the first person in their family to go to college, the first person in their family to go to law school and you can look at those students and when they walk across the stage at graduation, they are walk they are walking their entire family into yeah. a different future. Yes. You know, and that is just yeah. It's just tremendous. It's such a gift to be able to it's such a gift to be able to give to them, but it's also selfishly this huge gift yes. for us, you know, that yeah. we can be involved it matters. in that, it in matters. that experience this for somebody. Education. It really matters. So mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Rebecca. Thank you. It was you. so much fun talking to you, and I'm, I'm still so excited about the work that you do. I think it's so amazing. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. The Power of Attorney is produced by Rutgers Law School. With two locations, minutes from Philadelphia and New York City, Rutgers Law offers the prestige and reputation of a large, nationally known university with a personal small campus experience. Learn more by visiting law.rutgers.edu.